Um, we've just filled roles as we've needed, but as any startup company, you know, the first few hires you bring on are, are more or less like you jack of all trades, like project managers at that point, as we've grown, we're trying to figure out and, and work with people. Hey, what do you like? What do you do well? And let's have you focus on that. And that's kind of your one lane. And they still will do some other stuff too, like client onboarding. And we have somebody who's kind of done everything, but now he's focused more on sales, new client onboarding. So, um, or, or new client, uh, acquisition essentially. So he'll interview property owners or homeowners and see if it's a good fit. And then pitch them on our, our services and then pass it off to the onboarding team. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Michael Elefante is a real estate investor, a short-term rental expert, and social media entrepreneur. Michael, welcome to the show. Appreciate it, Sam. Glad to be here. Absolutely, Michael. There are three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show. In 90 seconds or less, can you tell me where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get started investing uh, in short-term rentals at the end of 2019? Uh, so listed them on Airbnb and Verbo. And today, uh, currently live in South Carolina. My wife and I own and operate seven short-term rentals that do, they'll do well over a million dollars in in gross rents uh, in 2023. Um, and it's been a, a wild journey, but, um, just in quick, we've figured out a great way to find solid investment opportunities in, in really strong markets and just figured out a way to differentiate ourselves and, and sell on the value in the hospitality space versus selling on price. So it's helped us uh, really stand out, and maximize our cash flow. Man, that is awesome. Three years, seven short-term rentals. I think we talked here uh, offline saying that, well, best how much longer after that before you say it's <laughs> going long? Yeah. So it was, um, just a quick background. We got the first one in Nashville when we lived there mm -hmm. and within, by the third month we were set to cash flow $7,000. Wow. Now we had like 40 grand in cancellations in a week when COVID first hit. Right. So we kind of had to pivot our strategy a little bit. Um, all the travels obviously come back through to Nashville. It's been stronger than ever, but that first property still cash flows us over six grand a, a month um, consistently, uh, which is amazing. So really that first property looking back on, I would have paid for all of our living expenses. So it's pretty wild to see that one short-term rental if done right and executed well, managed well, can pretty much set most people financially free, usually like one to three properties. But it was, um, by the third property, we were comfortable enough to, you know, officially claim financial freedom. Um, and that was within I think 11 or 12 months of going live with that first one. And then we acquired one more. So we were at four and we quit our jobs and we're like, you know what, let's travel. For a while before having kids. So we traveled in a camper van all over the U S for, we were like off grid for like six straight months, managing our properties from our phones with like hardly any cell service. Um, and then acquired two additional properties down in South Florida and just lived down there in the units in the van half the time, setting those up before settling down here in South Carolina. That's, that's a lot of fun. That That's kind of a lot of 12 month epic trip around the, uh, the, around the country and do as you have done on drawbacks to that. I would love to hear more about <laughs> yeah. that. The, 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 the travel diary of Michael and his <laughs> wife, you mentioned differentiate. That was one of the words that you had used when you talk about selling on value. For sure. I mean, the short-term rental space is getting um, very competitive and a lot of markets that it has never really had crazy competition with hotels. So a lot of urban markets, even vacation markets now, which have been around forever. A lot of people are figuring out, Hey, I can make a lot of money in short-term rentals. I'm going to start moving money into that space. Um, but to differentiate, you have to understand what people are are looking for when they're searching, especially if it's a special occasion, like a, a once a year family trip that they save up all their money for or throw it on a credit card. We're going to go all out. Um, most people want to experience something that they do not get to experience at home every day. Um, so that's why people visit places like Nashville, Tennessee or the Smoky Mountains. They want to go hiking. They want to um, experience Broadway and go to all the, the live music and kind of you know just drink and bar hop. Um, they don't get that at home in a lot of places. So now what do they not have at home that they can get in a vacation rental? I want to have an experience so fun that people don't feel like they have to leave the home to have a good time. So providing amenities, doing the appropriate research on what are people willing to pay more for and what are they filtering for on, on Airbnb and Verbo? So like hot tubs, game rooms, killer outdoor spaces, outdoor kitchens, theater rooms, home gyms, those types of things that um, really pop in photos because it's it's more of an emotional a, a purchase for people uh, to go on vacation or go on a bachelorette party, go for stay for a weekend for a family wedding or something like that. So anything that you can provide that kind of stands out 
to have a cool experience that they don't get at home every day. That is when, when you, when you say those things, outdoor, outdoor kitchen scenes outside, I'm thinking fire pits and cool like that. I would imagine that it would take a certain size and price of home in order to accommodate, say a movie theater built into the home. How does that, yeah. how does that pencil out? And how did you, how did you figure out that algorithm with only, you know, seven, seven potential attempts on your own? I guess, you know, if you, if you have seven of these properties yourself, you know, I would have thought that if you did it one way the first time, you're like, okay, that worked, we'll do that a few more times and then maybe modify. It sounds like an advanced strategy is I guess what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's really cool nowadays is leveraging technology and data in the marketplace. Uh, sites like EarDNA, and there's a few other data, data hubs out there where you can look at historical data, but not just that. You can actually look on a map on that site and look at where the top performing properties are one located. So I've invested in markets sight unseen, never been to the city before. And I based that first initial search on, hey, the top properties are clustered in these three pockets of the city in these zip codes. I work with the realtor. Hey, find me properties that fit this criteria, number of bedrooms, sleep this amount of people. Does it have a pool? Does it need a pool? Does it have a room that I convert to a theater room, right? Is it within budget to do that? Um, those types of things. And then number two is you can click on the listings from AirDNA on the top properties. And I could see why people are renting at such high rates and high occupancy at those places. What amenities do they have? What is their first photo? You'll notice trends. They all have a pool. They all have a hot tub. They all have a view. So that kind of helps me filter out properties that I don't even want to bother evaluating and then take it one step further. If I can provide the same level of experience in the same location as the top properties, what do they not have that I could get creative and add? Is it a custom interactive mural on a wall? Is it like a putt-putt course? Is it like, what are, what is like one or two things that I could differentiate and be my first one to, you know, first photo is going to get you that initial click on Airbnb. Then you get to a splash page with five photos. Mm -hmm. That's how you sell people. And you want them so bought in and professional photography edited really well. Twilight photos. If you have good outdoor spaces, you want them so bought in that like, man, I am so willing to like scrounge up pennies from under the sofa just to, just to pay for this property and have this one experience. And they want it too, for social media. People love to say, Hey, look, even if they have a hundred followers, look at this badass place I found, look at where I'm staying, look at how much fun I'm having. Like people are, are like, they, they, um, they love that feeling. So if you can provide that experience, one, they're going to have a better experience Two, They're going to leave you, uh, typically a better review, which is all going to play into more future bookings. Right, man. That's a, that, that's, that's powerful strategies. I love that. Let's talk, let's talk two things. Um, first off on funding. So how were you able, obviously you did one property, did really well. Did you just use the profits and the cash flow from that in order to show the bank that, hey, we're making money to go buy number two? Or how did you fund your deal? Yeah, so first deal was just conventional investment loan. We did 15% down. Um, the second deal, uh, my, both, my wife and I were in sales and we had established you know, commission history over the past one to two years. So we were able to, we, our goal is to maximize the conventional loans mm -hmm. as, as much as, you know, until we got to a point where DTI, couldn't qualify for any more. And then eventually when I, we left work, we pivoted to um, debt service coverage ratio loans, DSCR loans, which are getting ever more popular, especially in the short-term rental space, because certain lenders are figuring out a way to underwrite short-term rentals. It's very tricky because there's can be such fluctuation based on the operator themselves. But if you have experience, you know, typically they'll, they'll use not just long-term rental comps or, or, you know, lease agreements in place as part of the appraisal report to say, Hey, this will service the debt one to one or one to one point two or something like that. Um, but um, they'll actually look at Air DNA rentalizer or rental history or find comps from other short term rentals or from a management company. Um, and for DSCR loans, they're just looking at your credit and then if you have proof of funds and can the properties projected rental income service the debt, not mine. Um, but the second property to answer your question, we actually were so bought in to this strategy. I sold my truck to help furnish the first one because I didn't. I didn't realize like, oh, it costs this much to furnish like a big four bedroom house. So Eight. sold my truck, traded it in, got a little Honda CRV. That that stung, but never regretted that decision. Number two, uh, we were like, how do we find this next one? And we liquidated our retirement accounts on the spot. Mm -hmm. 401k IRA, dumped it, bit the tax penalty, whatever it was, um, got the second. Never regretted that decision either. Not financial advice, but it treated us very well. Um, and then the third one was just work and um, savings and um Cash flow saved up. Got it. No, I think that's that's really great. Is there is there a trick to find lender who will obviously commercial loans, DSCRs, all that mm -hmm. on a on yeah. A There's a few specifically that'll do that service coverage for short term rentals. 
Um, I really like working with the one brokerage. Um, Ricardo Carrillo has been my loan officer. He actually did my personal home. I've done like three refis, DSCR loans, and I've done like two or three new purchases with him now. Um, he's the leading loan officer with them, and they're the affiliated brokerage with uh, Bigger Pockets and David Green. That's his brokerage. Uh, he owns that with another guy named, um, I think it's Christian, who's who's awesome to work with. So I've worked with them a ton, and they're a broker, which is nice. So they'll go pimp out the loan to Rocket Mortgage, all these other you know providers um, who are actually going to underwrite the deal and, and take on the mortgage with you, and uh, they'll present the options to you, and you just kind of get the best one um, from there. But they they work with a couple that will do debt service loans. Outside of them, there are a few specifically um, that are they were built for vacation rentals. Um, I think ones like Host, Host Co, or something like that. Um, and there's a few others I'm blanking on them. But if you Google them, usually they pop up at the top of search um, as additional options. Got it. Very cool. Thank you. That is actionable information. Let's talk business organized. So I'm imagining you're traveling around the U.S. in a camper van. You have spotty cell service. It would be very easy as a business owner, I would think, to be in just reactive mode where it's like, oh, crud, you know, the cleaner didn't show up or, oh, man, you know, had a pipe freeze or something else. I mean, you're just constantly putting out small fires as opposed to growing strategically, scaling your business. And it sounds like it was really the latter than the former for you guys. My question is, how did you do it? Yeah. So um, kind of branching off the earlier conversation around tech, um, nowadays there's there's software for everything. So there's a software to sync your calendars with your cleaners. Um, we've used resort cleaning. We've used Turno, which formerly Turnover BNB, which is amazing because you can sync it with property management software, which syncs all of your listing platforms, Airbnb and Verbo. So any reservation or cancellation we get, our cleaners get immediately notified. They accept the project. We have ring cameras, so we can, if we ever need to check, hey, did the cleaners show up? You know, one of it'll pop up on our phone, but we can go always go check. But they've, uh, we've had like maybe two missed turns, which we caught thankfully, and then they fixed. But two missed turns over six, six, seven properties in three years, like pretty solid. And they just show up clean, and it's great. Um, and then maintenance that you know, depending where you're operating, you can uh, automate as much of that as possible too. If you get a maintenance issue from your cleaners or from a guest. Um, depending on like we use men BNB in Nashville, you just submit a ticket. They just go show up and a guest can even submit a ticket on your behalf, which is awesome. Um, but all the guest messaging, even reviewing guests that can all be automated. 90% of it's automated through property management software. So we had used guesty for host. There's a bunch of other ones out there that are awesome as well. Um, you can automate check-in instructions, check-out instructions, like as much as you want, which is fantastic. So you're right. It is, there is some reactiveness if you're self managing because we don't manage for the first three years uh, before building the management company. Um, but 30 minutes, 60 minutes a week per property for the amount of cash flow you're generating is substantial. And the amount you'll save by self-managing out of the gate will help you reinvest faster than forking up 20, 30% of revenue uh, to management company early on. Right. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So you guys came back, you got all the camper van life long in this strategy, but then you also mentioned, think you told me this off air, how many, what was it? A hundred properties that you guys now have under management? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty wild. Actually, one of the students from one of my first ever students from uh, my coaching business, when I launched that to teach others how to do short-term rentals, um, he took it to the next level. He was, you know, bought two properties, arbitrage one, um, partnered with somebody on a fourth and then he comes back to me a year later. He said, Hey, I started co-hosting for people down the street from my properties in the North Carolina and Georgia mountains. They were getting managed by Vacasa, Evolve, some of these big box or legacy mountain vacation rental companies that have not evolved over time. And all he did was say, Hey, I'm making $180,000 gross. You should be making a minimum 130, 150. What are, you, what are you bringing in currently? They're like, E. And it was literally like taking candy from a baby at that point. It's like, all we had to do is provide the most value to people. So that's how he started co-hosting properties. And then he approached me, Hey, do you want to like co-found an ma official management company? At first I said, no. And then I was, the more I thought about it, I was like, if we could be just provide more value and bring in more revenue, like we're just going to be super hyper-focused on bringing revenue and cash flow for our homeowners and provide a fair rate. There's no, and it just blew up. So, I mean, we were on 30, 40, 50 properties. Now we're approaching a hundred and we may acquire um, we're in the midst of a, actually an acquisition to acquire like 40 to 50 more properties from another management company that may be selling. So it's, uh, it's probably growing too fast for its own good, but we're really focused on nailing down all the operations before we scale too fast. Cause we want to make sure this is efficient for all the homeowners, um, 
as we grow. Yeah, I mean, shoot, you, you, you think you've already blown past the scale too fast. I mean, you're at, not too fast, but scale fast, uh, Mark. <laughs> sure. I mean, you're, you, you've, you've added 100 properties in eight months. That's pretty quick, uh, especially, you know, considering what business you're in. What have been what have been some lessons maybe or things even review mere eight months? Um, you know, uh, probably like four months ago, we tried to acquire, or actually we did, um, merge or acquire a few small management companies or co-hosts people who manage maybe like five, 10, 20, 30 properties. And we brought two on. One was a home run. She's she's a rock star. And now she manages, uh, she's like director of client success or, or client communications more so. But she brought on probably 10 or 15 properties from the South Florida market. Um, but she's been an amazing addition. So we basically bought her management business and then she continues to get commissioned on any new property she brings on. So pretty good deal. And then another one we brought on, we, and it was a little bit bigger and it was actually our first one. And I don't think we did enough due diligence and not all the properties met kind of our basic criteria of the type of property we want to manage, but we just saw it as a growth opportunity and just made it work and kind of forced it. Um, and it just wasn't a good fit. So we actually split ways, um, with that person and they took their properties back. So honestly, it was a pretty clean fix on our end. It was just, you know, Hey, no bad blood, but you know, even for him, he said he didn't feel like it was working out. So, um, I think that was a good lesson learned was do just doing proper due diligence on any type of acquisition. Cause that was new to us. We've never done any type of merge or acquisition. Um, so like, what do you pay for something like that? How do you structure it? Is it all up front? Is it, what are the terms? Um, so that's something that, as a business owner, um, is a little bit more difficult to, to learn and kind of roll with the punches. But other than that, it's been decent, um, scaling using virtual assistants as part of our client communication strategy. I wish we did that earlier on, but that has been very helpful. Um, as of recent, very talented people. Um, we just train them appropriately and they're able to help uh, offload a ton of a ton of day-to-day -day work um, for cheaper too. So it's been great. So those, those few things I would say. Yeah, absolutely. What, what, what about bringing team members on? I mean, it sounds like outside of maybe utilize. Yeah. Yeah. I want to say we have eight or maybe it's 10 full-time employees now actually outside the virtual assistant. So and then once they're onboarded, they're they're on with like our day to day team, um, where they don't we don't really hear from them a ton if we're doing a good job. But um, filling filling individual ro roles has been important, um, and I think that'll be more critical as time goes on. We also have a head of marketing uh, as well, and and so we're leveraging you know direct direct marketing to consumers, some online marketing as well to build the direct booking business um, to capture a little bit more revenue for ourselves and for for property owners off the OTAs like Airbnb. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Lastly, I know you guys have launched also a design company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Summer Led Designs. Um, again, one of my clients early on, my most successful student ever, um, he joined with me probably like a year and a half ago. He had two long-term rentals, no short-term rentals. And in the span of a year and seven months, he's, I think in March, he's going to do $150,000 gross and he'll net 50% of that probably on 10 properties and five of those he partnered with people it's amazing so his wife excellent designer not professional like background there but a professional marketing background her best friend was a professional interior designer for a company for multiple years awesome so they co-designed their own properties they were crushing it um so much so that i was like hey you guys should probably like offer this as a service i don't know i think i, I think it was me who mentioned that one day and they're like oh okay so they started doing it just on the side and clients were having like raving and like coming back to her. Can you do another property? Can you do another property? So then I just sat down with them and I was like, Hey, we need to formalize the business. Um, and it's grown. I think in January we had just shy of $80,000 revenue on that business and, um, should, should be a seven figure business by summertime, you know, annualized revenue. Um, but the service they offer again, it's the value first approach. What they and I understand that a lot of traditional interior designers don't is speed to market um, for short-term rentals is important. And that's usually a, so you could spend a year furnishing a house, a big house. So they'll design a home in a, in a week and then they could go implement it for you or they just pass along the, you know, the list and you go order it in the directions on how to implement everything. Uh, but they're ROI focused for homeowners. Hey, do this because it's going to increase your ROI. We've already done the research on top performing properties, this, that, and the other. Hey, you know, this amenity is probably not worth adding. It's just a big expense to make something look pretty, but you're not going to, it's not going to get a higher daily rate or higher occupancy. So they're hyper focused on delivering that for, for clients. And it's, it's been awesome. Like the client feedback and the properties they've set up is amazing. Um, 
So yeah, if you guys have any interest out there, Summerlet Designs, just go check out their work. They're, they're rock stars. How do you scale that? So they do everything remote. And then there's two tiers right now. So one is completely remote. They furnish the entire property, give you a stack of deliverables, even to where you could hand it to a contractor or like a project manager. And they would know exactly where to hang a photo, you know, this many inches off of this wall, like down to that detail. Um, and every single piece of furniture selected, uh, budget, all that good stuff. And then you can go procure everything and set it up. Or tier two is, hey, you just give them money and they do everything and they'll go professionally stage a photograph and everything how, from start to finish. How do you remote? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not this outside of my <laughs> wheelhouse entirely, yeah. even if I can yeah. walk in it, but I'm really just curious how from- Yeah, I will tell you design with short-term rentals is the most difficult part of oh. the whole process to master. Um, it is the hardest part for my wife and I, and we, you could spend, sorry for my dogs. Um, they, we've spent hours and days designing a single property, sure. um, but they've just nailed down the strategy to a point where they can do it in a few days, even a large property. Um, they'll just buckle down and, and do that. But, um, doing it remotely, they just need measurements of all the rooms and photos. Uh, video walkthrough is helpful, but usually it's just measurements and photos. And then they'll go do their due diligence on the research and build a cohesive design that works throughout the entire house. Again, fitting those amenities. Um, but yeah, they do. It, I just, it's amazing. They have all these special drawings too. So they could see exactly how each piece of furniture fits the spacing that's necessary um, for everything. Again, down to like the photos on the walls. Wow. That's really cool. I look forward to uh, maybe utilizing that at some point in the future. That's, that's a really, really cool service. And I love, I love the way you've just kind of like, you're like, Oh, okay, we'll add this on. And then there's, Oh, there's this business. It's not, I don't sounds like none of this came out as like, Hey, this is what we're set. You kept, you kept love mm -hmm. the way you've scaled, love the way you've grown. Michael, thank you for taking the time to come on the show today and really just share so much with us. You've given us tons and tons of actionable and certainly appreciate it. If our listeners want to get in touch with you, or learn more about you. What is for sure. Uh, social media. Um, Instagram is probably the best. I'm most responsive to, to DMs there, but at M Elefante six. Um, yeah, feel free to follow, shoot me a message. Um, and all my info is there through LinkedIn bio or just chat with me. But awesome. uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Fantastic. Thank you again, Michael. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah, Sam, you too. See you. Um, we've just filled roles as we've needed, but as any startup company, you know, the first few hires you bring on are, are more or less like, you jack of all trades, like project managers at that point, as we've grown, we're trying to figure out and, and work with people. Hey, what do you like? What do you do well? And let's have you focus on that. And that's kind of your one lane. And they still do some other stuff too, like client onboarding. And we have somebody who's kind of done everything, but now he's focused more on sales, new client onboarding. So, um, or, or new client, uh, acquisition essentially. So he'll interview property owners or homeowners and see if it's a good fit. And then pitch them on our, our services and then pass it off to the onboarding team. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big.